talk about leadership and change, particularly to frame those issues now in the global context because we've been given this extraordinary opportunity to connect with what's going to be one of the defining events uh, in contemporary history is happening on our watch in this class. I'm not going to say that the events that began in Tunisia and continued through Egypt and now are showing themselves in Bahrain and Libya, Yemen and Lebanon uh, are finished, but they certainly are underway. And we're seeing uh, a metamorphosis occurring. What's important for you to realize, and we'll talk about this perhaps on the blackboard a bit more, is that uh, youth of these countries are playing an extraordinary role. 60% of the population of the people in this region are under the age of 30. And they have lived uh, almost to the woman and man under a period of um, governmental system that is not democratic. Uh, what you're seeing now, based on a variety of impulses and interactions, is a change in what's acceptable. It's being called the Cairo effect, based on what we saw unfold for 19 days in Cairo. But it really is about the youth effect opportunity for people now having access to information and to one another in ways that were unheard of before to actually break the bonds of autocratic control. One of the chief measures that potentates and others have at their hands is the ability to control what you know and how you connect. And one of the reasons why the original 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution was set was to make sure you had the freedom to speak your mind and also freedom to assemble others of like mind. That assembly at that time in Boston and New York and Philly was getting into the same room or the same square. Now it's being able to see each other via Facebook um, or whatever other ways that you can connect. So we have not had a chance to uh, be together for, for some time, and I want to be sure that you're following along on Blackboard. The reflective papers that I've asked you for for each presentation can be sent to me by email or put in the blackboard drop box either way. The reflective pieces I'd like you to do on the five New York Times, they can be done at any time throughout the semester and submit them to me in exactly the same way. I'm not gonna return them to you, but I will use them as points of conversation individually, but also with the group as, as, as we proceed. Because of the weather, we've had a, a change in our friends being able to join us. Karen Keith, the Tulsa County Commissioner, had to send her regrets a Thursday ago when the snow was pretty high, but she'll come back later in the, in the semester and we'll weave her back in. And today, former Speaker of the House Chris Badger is going to be here and sent this incredibly kind note to us about his inability to be here, but is rescheduling right now to return. He really is excited about leadership and change and being able to talk to you about, about those things. What we are fortunate, however, is that um, another individual, another leader, who had agreed in advance to be part of our process for the semester is here with us today. So Ken has, uh, Ken Purdy has, in fact, repositioned himself in our list, but we are uh, absolutely pleased to have him, him with us today. If you went out to the website, of course, you saw that the bio on, on Ken, who is the mayor of the city of Tahlequah. I don't know how many of you are from Tahlequah. I wasn't born here, but I spent enough of my life here to feel like a, uh, a lifelong citizen. Ken. Purdy comes from a, a family who has deep roots here. And I recall as a very young professor of political science visiting the, the sporting goods store down on Main Street on the Muskogee Avenue where uh, Ken's family uh, uh, had, I, he'll tell you more than I, how many years that they were there. Tahlequah, as it says in Ken's bio, is the oldest incorporated municipality in this state. Many of you know the story of the Trail of Tears, et cetera, but when you look back in the annals of of Oklahoma history, Tahlequah stands out. Cannon was elected mayor in July of 2004 and then re-elected in, in 2007. He is currently just about ready to finish his, his second term and he has decided not to seek re-election. And as a result, of course, we have a very spirited mayoral uh, process underway and uh, I think I can see at least one of the mayoral candidates is, is here, Jason Nichols from our, our city council and I don't know if Todd is here or not, but Todd Enlo is the other finalist and they will be in about, what, 45 days or so? Something like that. 45 days, they will be following out the constitutional procedure of, of being standing before the electorate once again. And, and we also have a former mayor of, uh, of our city here, uh, our good friend Jerry, uh, who's part of this family, Jerry Cook, and we appreciate your service and also you being here, you being here today. Remember, those of your class members, part of our reason for being together was not only to learn from our leaders, but also to invite the community and others to, to be with us as well. 
Well, as mayor, Ken serves as the chief administrator of the, of the city. He oversees municipal services and programs. Our community, I think I saw the other day, uh, by the census county, somewhere in the 16 or 16,000 range, uh, in, in that particular range, looks like we grew about eight or nine percent over the last census. Ken has been actively involved in Tahlequah City government for more than a decade, holding a variety of other positions that hopefully he will, he will speak about. 1974 graduate of the Tahlequah school system. He went off to get his Bachelor of Science degree at Oklahoma State University, his Master's of Science at the University of Arizona. His professional career has been marked by employment in public agencies, academic and private business environments. <coughs> 25 years of experience developing public service programs. And since 1989, he has served as the program director of the Solid Waste Institute of Northeast Oklahoma, a Tahlequah-based corporation providing environmental management consulting services in a public interest capacity throughout northeastern Oklahoma. And for those of you that I know, many of you have a very strong sustainability interest. Ken is a, is a strong advocate in that area and could be very useful to us in understanding what's, what's going on. Since I've returned as a president, uh, actually, Ken was my next door neighbor uh, when I lived here before uh, on Katua Street. And returning and realizing that I had an opportunity to reconnect uh, as the president of Northeastern with, with this, uh, in, with this uh, community, uh, we began a series of, of conversations involving the, the city through through Ken and the chief of the Cherokees, Chet Smith. And there have been many, many early uh, morning meetings. And part of that collaboration has produced um, uh, a program called the Telequa, the City of Firsts, where we talk about what makes this place unique and uh, revitalizing and developing our core areas, including the university right on down the area. I tell you that because one of the basic prerequisites for great leadership or for leadership that actually is effective is the ability to see beyond your own position into the way your position becomes a collaborative opportunity for, with and for others. And I think I can tell you personally over the last nearly three years that Ken Purdy has been um, uh, not only a, a mayor that we're all going to remember, but a real strong connector for this university in trying to realize its goals. We cannot stand as an institution apart and beside uh, the, uh, the community in which we live, we must be in and of it. Stewards of the place means we have an opportunity and a possibility and a responsibility to connect with, with that community. And so looking at now issues of local government and perhaps hope a little bit about the environment and sustainability, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, our guest today, Mayor Ken Purdy. Ken. <laughs> again for those kind words and and as has I guess happened so frequently um, whenever I have the opportunity to listen to the president it reminds me that I would like to be in the room back in the rows somewhere soaking up that wisdom rather than at the podium and speaking because um, President Metz has always uh, things that to say that are uh, to me, in many ways, profound and, and certainly very timely. Um, I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to come visit with you today. And uh, I, I trust, I'm, I'm told, and I, and I trust that we will have um, interaction. Uh, this is mu as much about the, you uh, sharing thoughts and questions with me as me with you. Um, I have had, as the President said, the honor of serving as the mayor of the city for about the last seven years. And I want to share with you that this is not a position that I just vaulted into. And it, it's one that I worked at over time. And that from a leadership perspective, um, had the opportunity to share experiences and, uh, and, and, and gain some wisdom from role models and mentors like former Mayor Cook uh, and my father and many others uh, who were participants in this community and, and decided that they needed to contribute to the growth and development of the community as well. Um, so it, it, to me, it kind of gets to the point of, of leadership. You know, I know one of the questions that Mayors are often asked, and certainly I am in this community, is what compelled you to want to be mayor in the first place? And I think that that really is more a question about, you know, why, why do you want to lead? 
And, and I think that leaders do things, they, they, they express their leadership interests because they care deeply about something. I care deeply about my community. And I also think that, that we purchase kind of little real estate or build a very poor foundation for complaining about our community unless we're also uh, trying to contribute to the solutions that, uh, to the problems that we see in the community. So, so from my perspective, it's, pers it's very personal. Leadership is very personal. Uh, I love Tahlequah. I want to see this place where uh, my children are being raised, that I call my home, uh, that you all are spending time in, to be better than it was before. And we've had the opportunity to inherit good things from previous leaders and the obligation to build upon those good things that we did get the chance to inherit. Uh, before I go on and talk about any of the things that we're doing in Tahlequah, I do think it's kind of important that we have a basis of understanding when you talk about what the mayor in Tahlequah does, it's important to know that mayors across Oklahoma share a number of similarities, but there are also some real differences among mayors. There are, uh, and you may have had the opportunity to hear this in a, in a previous presentation or one subsequent, but there are four forms of government in the state of Oklahoma, that, that, uh, that if you want to organize yourself as a community and uh, govern yourself as a, as a uh, municipal government, you have these choices to make. Uh, those, those forms include things like a, a city manager council form of government, a thing called a strong mayor form of government, that's city of Tulsa would be a good example of that. Um, the aldermanic form of government, which is what Tahlequah has, it's also sometimes referred to as a weak mayor system, but I will be the first, and I think Mayor Cook would, would uh, jump out of his seat and also testify to the fact that there's no community that ever prospers uh, with anything called a weak mayor. Uh, mayors have to be strong, have to be the, leader, the leaders of the community. And then the fourth form of government in the state is, is the town form of government. And it's one that's typically uh, expressed by communities of fairly small populations that are looking for uh, the skill sets among the residents of the community to be able to help share towards leadership. Uh, effectively, that's what we all do, no matter what level we're talking about. But in the aldermanic form of government, we have, we have a, a legislative body, there's a city council, and, and here in Tahlequah, that's uh, currently four members. Uh, under, state, uh, under the Constitution, you can have up to, to eight members that are representative of the different wards of the city. Uh, Councilman Nichols currently representing the ward up here in the university area, or ward one of the community. Um, and the mayor basically votes in the legislative arena only when my councilors can't agree. And so I get to break the tie. And that doesn't happen very often, fortunately, I guess, for the, for the city of Tahlequah. We, uh, we tend to, uh, I think, at, at the end of a discussion, uh, share similar interest in the issues that are of concern and the direction that we need to head as a community to resolve those issues or, or improve upon the, the, uh, the, 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 the business or, or the uh, services of the city as it may be. Um, we also have a thing called a charter in Tahlequah, which is an incredibly important instrument for local governments. And the charter, is, is, as best I can explain it, is, is similar to uh, kind of the constitution at the local level. In fact, it's an expression of interests of the community that's approved by the voters <coughs> of the community that says, this is the way we want to organize ourselves, and this is the way we want to govern ourselves. And, and it, it lays out who, uh, you know, what, what the requirements to be a legislator are, a mayor, uh, how we're going to organize various departments, uh, how we conduct ourselves in elections, all those kinds of things. And I say it's incredibly important because there's only one document <laughs> in the state of Oklahoma that, is, that can trump or, or supersede any of the laws that we express through our charter. And that's the state constitution. 
and that does not get changed very often. Uh, state laws may come and go, but state constitutions are a pretty firm instrument. So when a community says, here's our charter, here's what we want to do, here's what we want to be, then it's a pretty stable document. At the same time, I think that we need to review that. We have to review that frequently. It's, it's, it's like anything else. It's not there forever. It expresses ideas that should change over time, and the growth and development of the community should reflect that. We've recently gone through a process where we asked a committee to review our charter. They have done so. They did so exhaustively. I believe Mayor Cook was, was uh, a member of that uh, committee. And, and they made recommendations that we ask our voters um, in this community to consider uh, or for changes. So anyway, there are some forms of government, various forms of government, Tahlequah specific form of government is called automatic. We have this really important instrument called the charter. And the one thing that, that in terms of how you think about mayors in communities though, that I wanted to indicate to you is, is kind of different here in Tahlequah and different in association with this thing called an aldermanic form of government is there are two forms of government in the state, aldermanic being one of those, strong mayor being the other, where the mayor is not only the symbolic head of the community who expresses, <coughs> pardon me, the vision and, and, and concerns for um, uh, to the challenges and improvements that are needed in a community, but also as the day-to-day -day business manager of the operations. And, uh, and that is, so, you know, that becomes a very real job when you get to a community the size of Tahlequah. Uh, uh, we have, when you add in kind of the permanent and part-time uh, employees, somewhere just under 200 employees, it's a $14 million dollar uh, business operation on an annual basis. Um, I think we got 12 square miles of territory that we have to provide municipal services to. Uh, about nine different departments and divisions of the city that provide various operations and services. So the business enterprise of the city in and of itself is a very significant undertaking and consumes a great deal of time and effort of the mayor. It is also that arena in which the mayor really has the opportunity to express and to implement those um, interests of change that are ratified by the city council. And they say the ideas go to them, and they say, uh, you know, if, if it moves forward, they approve it, obviously. Um, and then that mayor gets that opportunity to express that through the operations of the city itself in terms of its development. And that's been a fascinating process here at Tahlequah. We have uh, um, those operations over the past seven years have allowed us to, to experience and live through uh, two catastrophic ice storms, uh, historic snowfall recently, and a recession uh, the likes of which hasn't been seen since the 1930s. And yet today, uh, we're still um, and remain and uh, have shown the promise of a vital, growing community, one of the strongest in the state of Oklahoma, that has an amazingly rich uh, culture and heritage, um, a, a vibrancy of the community, uh, of which the institution that I'm standing in right now is one of the primary contributors, um, and partnerships with that institution and tribal governments like the Cherokee Nation uh, that uh, I think keep us on the right course uh, allows us to share our mutual interest in community development as they affect our respective organizations and entities, be it the university, be it tribes, uh, be it cities and the residents of the city. And, uh, and we see that around us. Uh, you see uh, a thriving business community. Uh, you see strong residential growth happening. Uh, I know you probably don't, and you've got a list of restaurants that you'd like to see coming to the community. Every time we have the opportunity to talk, there's always somebody who wants to see the Olive Garden or some other place come in. We can talk about why that may or may not happen later on. Um, but overall, the big picture is we are a strong place, and uh, we are a thriving place. And that's important for any local leader to understand and, and to recognize that there are assets 
that we have that can propel us into the future if they are uh, used wisely uh, and developed wisely and um, uh, that we have much to, to, to be thankful for, basically. Um, let me very briefly uh, um, share with you and maybe give you just a little bit of a, a preface for some of the things that, that we've been able to accomplish over the last seven years. And, I, and again, I can't underscore enough, and this is not just for former Mayor Cook's uh, edification, but um, we inherit the progress of previous administrations and people who've made those contributions and those commitments to work towards improvement in the community. I did the same. City Council that I work with right now have done the same. And I think we have made every effort to try to capitalize on those where we could and, uh, uh, and improve upon those and even ask new questions and uh, express new challenges and identify new needs in this community that we have responded to, I think, in a very positive way. Some of those, very briefly, that you'll recognize as you look around this community, when I took office, we didn't have a Lowe's, we didn't have a Chillings, there wasn't a thing called Tallacraw Crossings, no place like Tractor Supply or Atwoods. Those businesses weren't here yet. So one of the things that's been very important to me is that we have, uh, it, that, that we provide as business friendly of an environment as possible. And I think that that's, again, a continuation of past policies here in the city, and it has paid off well. Uh, there are, there not only have we seen strong development over the last decade, I think we have every reason to believe that we'll continue to see strong development in the future. Um, there are also just, there's a lot of the infrastructure issues. Uh, Mayor Cook and I also shared I, I think a similar philosophy about uh, uh, what airports mean to communities. Uh, both of us were pilots, or are pilots. Uh, so we had the opportunity to enjoy airports from a personal perspective. But when we stood back and took a look at what airports really mean for communities, we recognized that, as I've said to many groups, money doesn't come to town on a Greyhound bus anymore. It comes in a Learjet, a thing called a Beach King Air, and those kinds of transportation devices. And communities that are not positioned well to have airports that can serve those business needs will not develop in a strong business environment as those that do. Furthermore, it's been one of the best municipal deals that we can make. We get tremendous grant monies for being able to improve airports, and I think we have put every effort into making sure that ours is as strong as it can be, again, to position Tahlequah to be able to take advantage of the business opportunities that will come along uh, in the future for industry, for manufacturing, for retail trade here in the community. Um, so you, you see a lot of infrastructure around town that's represented by things like airports, things like developing solid waste facilities, kind of, Mr. President, back to the uh, environmental interests as a very long-term project because of the cost of that project, but one that's fundamental to be, uh, to be able to manage and properly dispose of and properly recycle the things that, uh, the, the, the waste products that we generate in this community. Um, we've also focused on the business plan of, of the city itself and have made every effort to try to improve things like the personnel and salary administration process. Um, one of the things that we uh, had the opportunity to do was to create a system where uh, we weren't reliant upon uh, providing favoritism to a particular council member or a particular department head who wanted to argue more passionately, strongly, and maybe effectively uh, for the merits of one employee or another, but put it into a system whereby individuals are recognized for their duties, their responsibilities, and most importantly, their performance over time and are rewarded as such and have taken many of those political pressures away from the legislative body on being able to uh, on, on identify who needs the rewards and who does not. Uh, so I think we've strengthened ourselves in that area. It also, again, as you walk around the community, you're going to see things like Norse Park, uh, which uh, seven years ago, 
uh, was a, a fairly derelict um, uh, half block of the commercial section of uh, the city of Tahlequah, North Main Street here. <coughs> and we had the opportunity by virtue of a request to the property owner to uh, acquire that property as community property and to develop it as a pedestrian park that was done in, with the intention of serving as a, a, a catalyst, if you will, and, and, a, and a base of support of other development that we saw happening in the north end of town. Northeastern has a number of properties in the north end of town, and I think we see that going on still today. Now, even now that the park's on the ground, we've seen a great deal of use. We're seeing other businesses develop in the area. The, the town branch is, uh, under, has, a, has a very significant uh, renovation going on right now. At the city, we're entertaining other um, uh, applications for uh, new businesses to spring up around the park area itself. Again, you know, that's one of those needs that we're identifying. Um, an opportunity presented itself. Uh, we chose to dedicate the resources to be able to capitalize on that opportunity, and we're going to see benefits from it as a, as a community. Uh, by the same token, I've always, and as President Betts indicated, I have always had a very strong, maybe soft spot in my heart for uh, the retail merchants of our community. You, I will argue with anybody that uh, you can't find a community the size of Tahlequah with the characteristics of Tahlequah that at its heart, our real strength uh, is our, our, our retail merchants in the community. We have many institutions uh, that are, are, are valuable, critical assets for the community, but the strength of our economy is the retail trade that goes on. My family were retailers all the way back to the 1930s in downtown Tahlequah. So I have always felt that the heart of a community needs to be its core downtown area, where we started that development and branched out from. And like, I, I would guess some of you have had the opportunity, like I have, to see some of those sadder communities where that vitality has been lost in a downtown area. You see vacant storefronts, uh, unused buildings, uh, decaying structures, and we've struggled a little bit over the past couple of decades, uh, even here in our community, with those kinds of challenges. So from the public perspective, I think leadership has an obligation to make sure that they can identify uh, where that strength needs to be maintained. And for me, that has been one that I think has been uh, uh, real obvious, that the downtown needs to receive special attention and that and that strength of your community needs to be expressed in that vitality of the downtown area. So we've made a lot of improvements. Uh, <coughs> former Mayor Cook started that whole process off, most recently, with things like the pavers that you see on the sidewalks, <coughs> um, some of the light poles that you see in the area. Uh, we've continued that process, most recently with the expansion and extension of things like sidewalks. Uh, we've got projects going on in the Downing Street area. We've replaced all the park equipment uh, in throughout that kind of downtown corridors, Coy Park in that area. Um, so, and, and acquired a building called the Army Municipal Center, the old National Guard Army, that now serves as a community center in part and also serves as additional office space for staff in the city of Tahlequah. Uh, again, as an opportunity to help strengthen that vitality, that that use of, of the downtown to make sure that people recognize it as a place where they want to be active, they want to do things that are important in the community, and um, uh, and have the have, have the city kind of represented in that way through through those kinds of developments. There are many more things that we've done uh, that that are going on in the city um, that uh, kind of fall into those in those same categories of other kinds of improvements. Um, and of course, we have core services, uh, things like police services, fire, ser fire protection services. Those for any municipality are the first things you talk about that people want to make sure. And their utility services, uh, electric, water, solid waste. Uh, you have an absolute obligation to make sure that those are the strong business and operational components of, of municipal government. Uh, the rest is opportunity. Those are absolute obligations. And I think we've maintained those strongly here in our city as well. 
So um, I'm happy and, and, and hopeful uh, that you will have other comments about our questions about our city, uh, your interest for our city, um, uh, and, and, and you know, kind of what you think about it in general. Um, I would say that uh, tying it back to the, the topic of our, our discussion, though, that the strength of every city, Tahlequah being no exception, is expressed by the conviction and the commitment of those people that we elect to be the leaders of the community. The mayor in most communities has that, has that honor and that obligation of being the spokesperson, the person who expresses that vision of the community, of the identification of the needs and the challenges that, that we need to determine whether we're going to rise to, to try to address, improve upon, uh, or, or whether we, uh, or whether we don't. And uh, in, in our particular case, the, uh, the mayor is also the person who kind of does the meat and taters day-to-day uh, -day operation of the city too, but it all ties together. And I think it has been a <coughs> chemistry that overall has been very successful and certainly for me has been very rewarding. Uh, thank you for your time here today and I look forward to, to the questions in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> for those of you that are just joining us for the first time, we'll spend a couple of minutes, a little bit of cross-talk with Ken and then we'll open it up to the uh, to the whole group uh, thinking about this community and about the future of our of our communities looking at many of you that are a whole lot younger than i am and i know you all have aspirations for what you're going to do in your lives how you're going to make changes that mark you're going to make for your for yourself for your families and whatever grand schemes you have i think about those things in the context of of um where you will end up at some point and what will be important to you and i'm thinking about our guest today because if you look at his resume Ken Purdy could be anywhere. Ken Purdy could be working anywhere at a variety of levels. The work he did uh, up, up in New York State, his work in Arizona, et cetera. Ken chose to come back, and we can say that that's because there was family, et cetera, but I think there are other reasons uh, that propel people. So one of my, my first question is, Ken, is uh, I know that the job of mayor doesn't pay hardly anything. As at least three people in this room know for sure. In fact, it's, I'm sure by the time the deductions are finished, you'll probably end up paying to be mayor. So, with all of the options that you have, with all the possibilities, why are you in Tahlequah and why did you run for mayor twice? <laughs> <laughs> if you shoot yourself once, why do it again? <laughs> the, um, Great point, great question, and, and I can only answer by saying that um, it, it ties back to my very strong conviction that, that we do it because we care. Uh, we do it because we care about something, first of all. Uh, I chose to be back in Tahlequah, as you say, and as you know, for, for family reasons. Um, I, I, at the time, was in upstate New York working at, at Cornell University. Had done so for seven years and had uh, an illness of a parent that I felt I could not attend to and, and, uh, and meet my obligations there uh, half a continent away. So I decided to come back to, uh, to the region, not to Tahlequah, but to the region, and, uh, and hopeful that within, if I could continue to, to uh, uh, practice my craft, which was in the natural resource management uh, profession, uh, that I would be able to uh, uh, be close enough to family to be of that service. Well, you know, life has funny and interesting little twists. And um, one day I opened a thing called the Tahlequah Daily Press, maybe even be called the Tahlequah Pictorial Press at that time, for those of us who've been around for a while, um, and saw an ad for a new organization that was being put together that had environmental interests and. It wasn't exactly what I had been doing before, but it was certainly one of in the in the same arena. And um, in fairly short order, I had my roots that were being reestablished in in Tahlequah. And and so, having made that commitment, I'm here. This looks like it's going to be home. Uh, it takes me back to um, 
I didn't necessarily have a whole lot to complain about, but I knew I wanted to be uh, make an effort to be a part of the of the uh, of the development of our community and the improvements that that I had to see. And so I volunteered, and there were folks like Jerry Cook and Sally Ross and Bob Robertson, who were all former mayors, that were uh, kind enough to say, sure, why don't you join one of our committees and contribute in that process. So that was about a 15-year period of actually contributing to, to, to various development interests in the community as a volunteer. So, again, I kind of didn't vault into this. I kind of crept it uh, up to this position. And, and I think that from a leadership perspective, we all have that opportunity uh, at some point in time to, to make those kinds of contributions and to express your skills and your experiences and your talents through, uh, in making that, that commitment through your leadership. Okay, so you're about ready to step out of the position of mayor. I guess, what's your last day in office? Last day, uh, I don't know, maybe the, uh, the, the individual who's interested in mayor can be, tell me more importantly, uh, or more precisely than I, I think it's somewhere around... May 2nd, I May 2nd, okay. Is, the, is that the first Monday I think that's of the first May? Monday. That's, the transition is the first Monday of May. Okay, and so it's May 3rd, and... Um, we're walking down Muskogee Avenue, we run into each other, and I say, okay, it's all over with. Tell me what you think was the, the great high of being in this position. What was the greatest reward? And what's the challenge that you look back and say? We should have had that one back again. Yeah, I, I want another shot at that one. Yeah, yeah. What would that be for you? Um, uh, thank you. Um, the, probably the greatest high, I think, was we had an opportunity a few years ago to ask, uh, uh, by, in fact, it was about two years ago, to ask the community whether they were interested in committing additional sales tax dollars to improvements in the community. Any leader of a community, of a municipal government, will tell you that asking their community to commit sales tax dollars to anything is a challenge. It's a great challenge. And the arguments have to be extremely strong uh, to, to get your, to the confidence of the community to say, we want to do that. And we came to our community and said, folks, it's been 25 years since we made a decision collectively as a community to reinvest in ourselves and the improvements that, that we want to make in a community. And so, we started a number of public meetings where, much like this, where we would simply sit down and talk about what kind of things do you want to see? And what ultimately resulted from that were four classes of different kinds of projects. Uh, one, we had, we had an argument and, and a, 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 an interest, I should say, from a municipal perspective that we presented to the public and the public said, makes sense to us, that we needed a new fire station. Uh, we have one fire station in the city of Tahlequah right now, and uh, we have uh, studies that, have, that are done periodically that said, gosh, this community has grown large enough uh, and expanded enough where we need another fire station to be able to service that need. So that was one class of projects. We have always got street improvements. Every community's got street improvements that need to be made. We have some priority areas and classified those, estimated costs associated with those. Uh, we had, uh, uh, interest in community beautification, uh, image enhancement again, uh, that was another class of projects. And then we had uh, one that was very popular, and I know Mr. Nichols as a very young person grew up in this community playing basically soccer in hay pastures. And, uh, and to this day, uh, and I wasn't of the era that soccer was an, an option, uh, you know, it was usually Little League Baseball, but nowadays, People have option to play soccer, and that's a very, uh, uh, a very popular uh, youth activity. And communities are the appropriate uh, vehicle to be able to help facilitate the development of those sites where we play those activities. And families that come to your communities want to know whether or not you, as a community, are providing places where their families can go out and, and engage in those kinds of recreational activities. I call that quality of life infrastructure. 
Anyway, we identified the St. Louis Sports Complex as another class of projects. So we had four of them. We went to the, uh, we ultimately got to the stage where we said, we think we have enough definition on what they want, what we want those to be as a community. We've heard from a lot of folks. Uh, we think we know what the costs are going to be. We asked our voters to they improve it, and it was about close to two thirds of our voters said absolutely yes. So proudest moment has to be, I think, that That's great. Uh, where where you had this ringing endorsement from the community to commit our resources to reinvest in the improvements that we all want to see. The one I'd like to have back is probably charter review. Okay. Um, I'm I'm in, I, I pretty firmly believe that. Uh, that we are not necessarily best served as a community where we elect the business manager of our community. I absolutely uh, couldn't agree more and strongly believe that we need to be electing individuals, the, the, the mayor of our community to be the uh, head of our government and the person whose obligation is to uh, make sure and express those visions of common interests and, and identify the challenges and the needs to take the initiative at the legislative chambers and the legislative councils to be able to see that enacted into policy. But after that, that needs to be handed off to somebody with, with known skill sets, with exper known experience that we can say, go to it, do it, grind it out, make it happen. I've got other important things from the development perspective and from the community, the big picture that need to be focused on as the leader. You get on with, and that's the city manager form of government. There are 24 cities in the state of Oklahoma of which Tahlequah sits in the population, in the same kind of population category, between 10,000 in population and 25,000 in population. Does anybody want to venture a guess how many of those have government like that, like we do in Tahlequah? About, I don't know what it is percentage-wise, numerically 22 of those 24 have gotten to the point where they say, we think there's a better way of dealing with our business operations. That's the city manager form of government. I have been and will continue to be uh, an advocate that I think that as a community we will improve, uh, that we can do that better. You know, one, uh, I thought it was really interesting, one of the, uh, and you know, uh, community discussion is all about being able to express difference of opinion and, and being able to argue those points. One of, the, uh, one of the opinions that came up early in that process was by a long-standing resident of the community who said, you know, I've always felt like if it ain't broke, we just you know, there's no need to fix it. You ever, how many have heard that adage? Sure. Well, you know, and my counter was, if that were the case, we'd all be driving Model T Fords. They were great cars, they weren't broke, and they were good forever. But we don't drive Model T Fords. We identify what, you know, the opportunities they are to make it better. And I think that from my perspective, that that's one I'd like to have back, I'd like a do-over on that one. But uh, I think we will eventually get around to addressing it again. Well, thank you very much. I have a number of questions I'd like to ask, but I'd like to really open it up to the, to the classes, the friends that are here today. Uh, this, this is a chance to uh, interact with uh, <coughs> someone who has, uh, I, can, I can say this, and this is a nonpartisan comment, it's a walk the talk sort of issue. There are people that talk about what they'd like to have happen, and there are people that will grouse about what's not happening. Occasionally, you have to decide if you're actually going to make a difference. Are you in it or are you out of it? Whether you think you're right or wrong, you have to decide if you're going to make a difference. That can be from a voluntary position or it can be from an elected position, which is nearly voluntary in terms of the remuneration. But it's about seeding back to what you believe in, whether it's your country, your city, your state, the world, whatever it might be. And we've talked a little bit about that indirectly with some of the pieces I put out there to you before. But here we have someone who is um, from, this, the, from this city, has made a, obviously a contribution to the city, but has had other options and other choices. So I thought you might like to have a chance to ask Mayor Purdy some questions before we have to close our session. So the floor is open. Anyone would like to address a question to the mayor? Yes, in the back. Yes, um, I was wondering what your role has to do with like, education. Like, 
the elementary schools and stuff. Because if you wanted to, to make children learn how to recycle at a really early age or something like that, how, how would you be involved in something like that? Could you all hear the question? Got it? Okay, good. So, so basically, how does the mayor right. get involved with, with issues like that? Well, uh, you know, the answer is that the mayor doesn't have a direct involvement with the education system in terms of policy making, budget administration, that sort of thing. We entrust those responsibilities to, to entities like school boards and school systems. Um, and there's a lot of discussion we can talk about in here about how uh, we, do, we do other things, I think, in an interesting capacity. We run the business of, of cities in, uh, in an interesting way here. We kind of spin off other areas like utilities, uh, industrial development, um, hospitals. You know, there are lots of things that happen because municipal government took the initiative to make it happen. But once we get it up and going, we turn it over to business entities that are maybe better better position to be able to address the full gamut of, of challenges that they have. Well, back to your question. Um, what mayors, I think, can do, what le leaders of any class can do in, in a community is to help facilitate those issues of importance for education. Um, you, you know, we have those opportunities to, to extend uh, probably one of the greatest ones would be a chance for people to become familiar with how the government operates. Uh, the whole lesson here today, basically, from my perspective, is, is it kind of revolves around two or three main points. One, you care, you get involved. Okay? And if you want to get involved, you need to know enough about the system that you want to be involved with to be able to participate in that. You do that here at the university. Uh, you, 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 know, you, you go out and do your research, you find out about the university, you make one level of commitment, you come here, you do more research, you find out about what kind of curriculum you want to be involved with, you make commitments to that. Same thing, same thing goes for communities. You want to be involved in the community, as I say, purchase a little real estate to be able to complain about your community by participating in it. We, you know, I think the leaders of every class are, are more prone to listen, more prone to engage people that they see trying to make that contribution rather than just casting stones. That's a great point. Um, so, you know, in the education arena, I think we have opportunities to, um, to extend direct involvement with students of every class. Perhaps more importantly, and just very briefly, we have opportunities to endorse the efforts of communities to use a common resource and uh, take us back to that capital improvements package that we just talked about, our, our, our initiative. And by the way, from those initiatives, from a leadership and change perspective, they happen because you find a champion. Okay? They happen because there's a champion for those causes. You have to have endorsement of a body of people, a legislative body, and uh, you have to have endorsement from organizations, but you always have to have one or more champions for that. Somebody, somebodies who will get out, make the sales pitch, make the commitment to making the argument before the larger community to see whether or not this idea is sellable or not. And we express whether it ultimately whether it was sellable by our vote. And uh, anyway, that happened with kind of the community's ability to be involved in the education system here locally at that same time. Because what the question we asked was, we want to dedicate a sales tax. Part of that we want to dedicate for municipal improvements. But there was, uh, Jason, what, about $3 million? Four, close to $4 million. 3.2, wasn't it? That, that's right, 3.2 going to, that, that was targeted for improvements in, to the, edu the public education system here in our community through Tahlequah Public School Systems, who wanted to build new elementary schools and improve cafeterias and other facilities that they already had, and in transportation equipment and all that sort of stuff. And so that question had to be filtered through Tahlequah city government to be able to get to the voters in the first place. 
And so Tahlequah City Government, through the wisdom of our city council, said, sounds like a very reasonable question, an important issue, and we need to ask the voters of the community whether or not they agree with that. And so, again, through the process then of, after the decision was made to forward it to a vote, we had basically a lot of sales pitches to make. Sure. And so we engaged the community wherever we could, talked about it in as open and uh, fashion as we could to answer any question. And at the end of the day, I think we found enough people to agree on it um, in the community that it's, we said, move forward, let's do it. Thank you very much. Is there another question? Yes, um, let me go over and pick up, uh, please, Carrie. Um, what qualities do you believe are important to succeed in politics? Qualities do you think are important that you should have in order to succeed in politics? Mr. Mayor? Um, pondering. <laughs> Well, I, I think they're the, I think they're the, probably the same qualities that I would bet you would identify that uh, in any person that would um, would enable you to label that individual as a quality individual. You know, things like integrity, uh, honesty, uh, industry, or commitment. Um, I, I can't do this job from my perspective unless I dedicate almost full time to it. I think that the job of being the mayor demands that in this day and age in our community. And yet to do that, um, I have to basically sacrifice my private job because the public job does not support me or my family. So one can only do that for a certain period of time before they have to say, I love it, but enough is enough. I've got to go back and put beans on the table for my, my, my family. Um, that kind of gets back to the question about why did you decide to do it for a second time? Because the, the, the pile of beans wasn't that short, but now it is. Yeah. Uh, but, so, you know, that, those are some of, I think, the, the, the qualities of individuals. Uh, it, you, you know, you, you have to be a, a, a person who is honest and open and committed and, and, and capable, and more in, in, in our particular case, you also need to be an individual who has a success or, or, or probability of success of being able to manage, steer, operate a, quite a sophisticated business operation. And those are demonstrated, I think, over time. Uh, in whatever organization or community you might find yourself uh, by your contributions, uh, by others recognizing what those contributions are, what your experiences are, what your skill sets are. Uh, and for me, that happened through the process of just, again, being engaged with my community, but volunteering an awful lot, and somebody would say, would you serve on this committee? Uh, you know, I can remember some late nights at Mr. Cook's business uh, where we were serving as volunteers trying to address uh, uh, municipal issues. Anyway, o over time that happens. But I, I think that those are, those are critical issues um, and, they, and those skills and experiences also manifest themselves when you have to engage some very high level uh, challenges for your community. I just shared with the uh, 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 president a uh, contribution that I made today to a newspaper uh, to express concerns about what I see as a potential impact on our community from the loss of an agency. But it puts the mayor of Tahlequah in direct opposition to the governor of the state of Oklahoma who's making that proposal. That's not a real enviable place to be. Um, you don't want to be there, but sometimes the, the causes are right the, from uh, we see uh, the impacts that may not be seen at other levels, and I think we have the obligation, no matter how scary that is, uh, to to make the argument and to express that, to let others know that uh, we could be hurt, and uh, and we don't want that to happen. And we think that there are other alternatives. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we can take one more question. Um, I think you have to ask one last time. I'm going to go over here. Nicole, do you have a question still? Um, I could ask it, yeah. Okay. 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 Come um, on. With the current recession, we all know that there's no money there. With all the politics going on, like budgeting, education, Republican, one kind of stuff like that, 
what is the city of Tahlequah doing to keep up the city itself and to attract people to move here and say, look at us, we can keep you happy, we can give you the quality of life you're looking for. How is the city doing that and what can the average citizen do to help the city maintain where we're at and improve itself? Okay. Everyone hear a question? Good. <coughs> Pardon me. This is your swan song, so. Boy, it is, because uh, uh, you, you saved the best to last. Uh, just a, a fantastic question. It gets right to the heart of the challenges that every municipality faces. Um, and I'll have to share a few details with you to be able to answer that. I think that it, it, the, the um, in a nutshell answer, kind of hanging on by the skin of our teeth is, is how we do it. Um, we address the service needs of the city of Tahlequah, I would say adequately, adequately. And I think through business practices that, that we have tried to incorporate into the institution of the city government, we've been able to manage our funds about as efficiently and, and wisely as we know how to be able to do things like replace the equipment that needs to be replaced to repair the streets. And would we like to have more? Could we make better roads and could we make greater facilities? And you bet. Who would? I want, I want more and better things for our community. But folks, the old adage is true here. Believe me, uh, I, I don't know where the fat is in municipal government because we've just been carving meat. That's all we do. We don't trim fat off. Um, there's, there's, there's just nothing but um, challenges to how to use your money wisely. And so what we've been doing here is kind of just as we do at home. If we want to purchase something nicely later on or good case in point, so we've got a, we've got a, a 50 year old uh, facility that is the hub of where all of our trash goes in town. Now you don't care, most of us probably don't give a hoot about what happens with uh, your garbage, just as long as it leaves you curtain, you know? And, and maybe you begrudgingly pay that $12 a month to the city of Tahlequah to make sure that that happens. But those of us involved in the business operation are looking at the pennies and the cents of whether that $12 really covers our costs and whether that facility can really handle it all. and. Uh, and so we made the decision that that 50 year old facility down there isn't going to do it, but we didn't have the $4 million to plop a new one on the ground the next year. So through a process of reserve funding, and again, just like we do at home if we wanted to buy something nice and we have to stock away a little bit with every paycheck to be able to, into our savings account, to be able to ultimately get to that, that's what we've been doing in the city of Tahlequah. That's how we've been kind of meeting those demands. So I would say, Again, kind of back in summary of, of, of the answers to your questions. One is, are we doing okay? Yeah, we're at, we assess, and this is the other important thing to know about municipal government, and I, and I find this to be a misperception uh, with a lot of groups that I talk to, and that is how do we fund municipal government? How do we fund the improvements that happen in municipal government? We do it in, in the state of Oklahoma uh, through the process that's allowed by the state legislature. And that is we use our sales tax dollars that gener are generated only within our municipal limits to fund all the services, all the improvements, basically, that happen for city government. Uh, the other source of major funding is through uh, property tax. Uh, we own property, we pay taxes on that. But cities in Oklahoma don't see a penny of that money. We only see sales tax money. So, gives you the basis of comparison for how Tahlequah does with the other communities and tax commission reports that on a monthly basis. If you look at the state tax commission's records, you'll see that the city of Tahlequah assesses two and one half cents to fund municipal government. Well, one half of that penny is funding those two classes of projects we talked about a minute ago. This young man's question up here about what, you know, how are we involved in the education system? What are we doing to support that? We're contributing part of that money, that $3.2 million of that one half, that's generated by that one half cent to help support education projects and programs. The other part, we're, we're contributing to other improvements on the municipal front that we've talked about. The two cents then that's left over 
is what funds police protection, fire protection, parks improvements, street improvements, uh, cemetery operations, anything else you can identify that is generally provided by the city of Tahlequah. A few things we, we support with fees. Will that need to change? Most other cities in the state of Oklahoma assess higher, a larger amount of sales tax to provide the services that they do. So when you go to, maybe back to your home community or another community and you see something really nice that you really want to see in Tahlequah, come back and argue it with us. Come back and let's discuss it. Come back and let's talk about it and identify as an improvement something that we need to work toward but also arm ourselves with an understanding of why that community can do that. Do they assess three cents of sales tax money compared to our two cents? Do they, in other words, operate off of more revenue than we do? Um, you know, do they have the opportunity to do more things because they have more, more funding that their community is dedicated to? In most cases, you will find that to be the case. Uh, back to all of those 24 cities that we talked about in the state of Oklahoma, the city of Tahlequah assesses the least amount of sales tax to support city government than any of those other cities. Is that a significant challenge for us? Absolutely. Will we have to address that ultimately? I think we will as a community. Uh, do we have challenges? Significant ones because there are other taxes that get stacked on there has to do with the commitment that people make to make a difference in the world in which they live. And uh, I gave you a sheet early on, which is actually a digest of the book that you're reading called The Five Practices and Ten Commitments of Exemplary Leadership. And I was thinking about these practices and commitments as, as Ken was speaking and realized that all the things we want to have happen around us are really the sum total of the things we're willing to do ourselves. So when, you're, when, you, when you really are passionate and want things to change, the best place to start is in the mirror in the morning and commit yourself to what you think is important and do it to the best of your ability. And I think that, that Ken, across the spectrum of his, of his life, including his, his what will be eight years as, as mayor, um, ex has exemplified that. And I want you to help me thank him for being our guest today. Before you get away, I want to be sure if you're in the class that you uh, make sure that you point, push your reflections onto me. And I want you to be a little substantive now. Just don't tell me you liked it. I really need to know some of the marrow of the process. Some of you did a very good job the last time. I think a couple of you still owe me, uh, owe me some pieces. I want you to go back through the book and get through the first three, um, excuse me, the three of the five practices. So you begin to bring those into your thinking as we listen to our, to our friends here. Next week, we're going to have a, a panel of three very bright uh, leaders younger than Ken and I um, who are going to provide you with uh, a very dynamic session. Uh, two uh, members of our, two chairs of two of our departments, uh, Dr. Kerry Keller and uh, Dr. Amy Aldridge Sanford and the Dean of our, of our Student Affairs, uh, Dean Laura Bourne. We're going to talk to you about uh, dynamic vision of, of leadership and opportunity and I'm really looking forward to that session and, and for you being here. Through the week, change and leadership. Leadership and change. We have a hyper change situation on the global level. I want you to continue to follow it. This is almost like a unique case study for us as we look at the relationship between change and leadership. And I will push some things out to you through the, through the Blackboard. And please, by email or through the Blackboard, let me know if I can help and what thoughts you might want to share. And